Hello and welcome to our audio commentary. I'm Nick Redmond, documentary filmmaker and record producer, and as always, I'm <laughs> sitting here with my <laughs> very good friend, Julie Kiergo, writer, scribe, essayist extraordinaire. Oh, my God. And we're here today to talk about a film that you like very much. I uh, love it. And is about one of my favorite subjects, football. <laughs> and by football, let us make it clear at the outset, what are we talking about in American terms? Well, soccer. Yes, it's called football everywhere in the world except for the United States. Don't ask me why. Well, and it doesn't matter if uh, we don't want to confuse it with American football, no. for example. Um, football is the great passion for um, a large majority of, uh, well, in fact, as you said, the entire world mm -hmm. plays this game. It, this is allegedly the most popular game in the world. And um, what is really interesting about Fever Pitch and the book on which it is based by Nick Hornby is that he is writing about British football in a period, the 70s and 80s, when it was completely unfashionable to be a football fan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was almost a societal stigma about it. If you went to football matches, there was de facto something wrong with you. I think that's one of the themes, in a way, of this movie because the star, Colin Firth, plays a young teacher, an English teacher, who it, it's very hard for some people to reconcile that fact with the fact that he is a tremendous uh, football fan, um, and in particular a fan of, of Arsenal. Um, sorry, I had to say Arsenal. We should probably establish at the beginning here that... Nick is a fan of a very different London area football team. Well, as everyone knows me, knows, Chelsea Football Club was my old alma mater and passion. Um, but I have no problem talking about Arsenal, a.k.a. the Gunners, in a non-partisan and completely fair way today. So open-minded. It, it actually, you're going to be very happy because I think the, one of the other things that's very interesting about this is that you see that even the most die-hard Arsenal fan also hates his club. Even as he loves his club, he hates it. He calls it fecking rubbish. <laughs> um, and that occurs over and over again with every single person who's portrayed as, as a lifelong fan. Uh, before we get into the movie proper, I must just point out uh, for fans of total uh, miscellaneous arcana in the in the main title sequence you see a batch of coins against a cardboard background yeah i was wondering about that and that was a, a promotion by esso the petrol people mm -hmm. for the 1970 world cup which was set in you know staged in mexico uh, britain who were at that time the holders they had won the world cup in 1966 the only time england has ever won what a year. this coveted trophy but in 1970 as defending champions they went to mexico and esso did this coin thing which was all of the players in the squad's faces on those coins. Mm. And, uh, I don't I can, suppose you own that. I can tell you that as a major league anorak, as we say in England, <laughs> I may have those still somewhere. May you now. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about Colin Firth, who was not uh, quite the big star then that he is today. No, he was probably more of a star or beginning to be a star in England um, than he had become internationally. He had already made what a lot of people think of as his groundbreaking performance as Mr. Darcy in the BBC production of Pride and Prejudice. That was in 1995, uh, so just a couple of years previous to this. And, and he became sort of like a crumpet um, from playing Mr. Darcy. One of the things I think is initially very interesting is that the character he plays here, the, the football maniac, Paul, um, is about as different from Mr. Darcy as you can get. He's shambling, he's shaggy, he's, you know, kind of inarticulate. Um, you know, it's still our kind of... The thing I always find so remarkable about Colin Firth is look at him, he's like a bear. And yet he's so completely adorable. There's a huge warmth about this man, even though he is often often plays characters who are like almost painfully repressed. 
And and one of the things in this this film that I like so much is this incredibly repressed man is a volcano of feeling, and that only gets to really come out on the football pitch, either here where he's he's coaching his school team, or you know at. At Highbury, that's Highbury. That's the Highbury was then uh, Arsenal's stadium. Yes, right. Um, so, or, or actually, in any any football stadium, um, he he can finally let loose with his emotions, and he's but he's also very thoughtful. This character, and has begun to think more and more about his connection to football, and of course, his relationship with this. That rather snippy young woman is is going to make him think about what else there is in life besides football even more. It's interesting, I feel. I mean, I know that you know an awful lot about screenwriting and the structure of films. And I, I find this one oddly structured if it is going to be what we would call in America a rom-com, if this is what it primarily is. And let's first say that uh, Nick Hornby adapted his own book, and he has written, I think, a very good screenplay based Mm -hmm. on that book because that book is a miscellany of memories. It's a memoir. And what he has done here is is to is to turn his obsession into a pretty believable story about a football obsessed teacher kind of in a sense falling for uh, another teacher who does not share his interests one iota but his in this very scene to me um is where the structure is a little odd this is not going to be a rom-com where we wonder are these two ever going to get together or not? Right. Because in this scene, six minutes into the film, she's talking about shagging on the carpet. Uh, and She actually says, and I find this very interesting, I've seen this film, you mm. end up shagging on the carpet. Exactly. That's the friend, I think, who says that. But, it, yes. but what, it, what it tells us right off the bat is that she already already is attracted to him. Mm-hmm. She doesn't like the fact that he's interested in football. She goes, that, that he's a yob. Him, that makes him a moron, as we said earlier. Um, she can't understand the dichotomy that there would be a man who was an English literature teacher who mm-hmm. knows a lot about the classics could also be some kind of an idiot that would go to a football match and mm-hmm. stand on the terraces. But she's also terribly insecure about her own role as a teacher because she wants to be popular like he is, and she doesn't know how to do it. Right. But, I mean, once again, there you have the dichotomy between these two characters. Um, it's, it's, it's not just that she's prim and uptight and, and that he's, you know, a, a football yob. It's also that he, he has learned to be a very gifted teacher in part because of what football has given him. For him, football is kind of like a familial event. It replaces the family that we see in flashback, you know, the family that was split up by divorce. And, um, in fact, uh, um, it, this has gone into in, in great, much greater detail in Nick Hornby's book, his memoir of his own childhood, adolescence, and young manhood. Um, so... So there's there's the, the kind of basic dichotomy be, between these two people. But it's also that he, Paul, because of his enormous um, familial feeling from football, is able to recreate that in a way in his classroom. And he's, he's father, br- big brother, all of those things with his students. He's also extremely helpful to their parents, as we'll see, in part, again, by using football um, as a kind of bridge to certain other issues. She, meanwhile, is about as uptight as you can get. She is not relating to anybody on any kind of warm human level. She's, oh, as he later says in the movie, she can only think about stuff that you can tick off. Um, she's got lists and she's got forms and, and all that kind of thing. She's not being human. By the way, this is Mark Strong, who has, in just in the last, like, 10 years, become quite well-known for often playing international villains and spies and things like that. I think it's such a pity. I think he's hilarious. I think he's an absolutely marvelous comic actor with a little touch of 
sadness as here when he's like he's he's teasing his brother who who actually manages to play on a semi pro team something like that and and he he one of the funniest lines in the movie is when he's speculating about how, well, maybe, he, you know, he's still got a chance of being a football player, you know, and and um, Colin Firth says to him, well, that doesn't seem very likely to me. And 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 Mark Strong says, well, it's it's the smoking. And Colin Firth says, it's not the smoking, it's the crapness. <laughs> <laughs> is that like a fantasy for football fans that that they could somehow be players? Well, um, I'm sure that, uh, you see, the thing about sport that I always find fascinating is it looks like everybody can do it. And in fact, everyone can do it in the sense that you can play, you know, on the, play, uh, on the playground <laughs> at school. You have a kickabout with your friends. Some people even uh, progress to what they call in England the Sunday leagues, which is where basically a lot of overweight people from the pubs, you know, get together and they play in teams. <laughs> you know, obviously the level of the sport that they're playing, it bears almost no relationship to the actual sport. Uh, <laughs> but you can be on some level involved more than just being uh, a watcher. Uh, I've always loved, uh, I've always known that I cannot play any sport, uh, yeah. but I have loved watching football just as I have loved watching tennis. And actually, I think we should mention about Mark Strong. It might be amusing to him now to think, looking at him here, yes. that just last Sunday when you and I were watching the Super Bowl, an American <gasps> sport, I know there he say. was featured in one of the primary ads with Ben Kingsley and with Tom Hiddleston as if these are the three most debonair Brits you can imagine driving their Jaguars and, I know, he and plays living the, the high life. He's the opposite of debonair here. But you're right. I mean, this is what happened. He, he, he's become an international man of mystery. Who could have guessed it? And as we see um, <clears throat> the young, we know that the character is called Paul in the film. Right. Uh, it is Nick Hornby. Right. Um, and as we see the young Nick Hornby here, I wanted to uh, just bring up something that you said earlier, uh, which was something I find very interesting and which his book does detail very well, which is that when his parents separated, and eventually his father went to live in France and had a whole new family and everything mm. over here. The father would come to visit Nick and his sister um, and take them somewhere. Uh, and he goes into great detail about how they'd end up in some restaurant where there'd be nobody but them and there'd be no conversation. Which is the opening of the job. film. Exactly. How's but your chicken? Okay. One day, one day, the father suggests that, he, that they go to see Arsenal play. Mm. Nick uh, certainly the character Paul in the film is not a football fan at that time. But from the moment that he arrives in the stadium, yes, and we're going to see we're the shot. See we're the going magic to see the moment. magic moment. And this really is magic. And I really truly believe that for anyone, this probably is true for any sport, but certainly for me, the very first time that I was taken to a match at Chelsea in 1968, uh, not by my father, but by a slightly older friend, when you got up to the top of the steps, looked down into the bowl, yeah. it was it was a religious experience, something that you connected to. Well, and it shot this way. Here we go. Here we go. It's like you're going into a church, the church of football. And from the moment that you see the ground, you see that enormous expanse of green, you see all those people and... The crowds were large, particularly in these days. This is set in the year 1968. Oh, oh, this part. When, yeah. when he is seeing for the first time, the crowds would would routinely be 60,000 people. Wow. As he says, larger than the population of, the, of his own town that he lived in <laughs> at the time. Would all be gathered for this religious experience. And then he tries to counterbalance the religious experience with the swearing and the hatred that he feels in all of the people around him for their own team. Yeah, but look how much he, he takes to it. <laughs> he takes to the swearing and the hatred. And he can't understand why is it you love being here, you love your team, why do you hate them so much? And why do you? You hate them because they can't always do what you want them to do. <laughs> And I think it successfully works in the film when you see Paul and his buddy played by Mark Strong playing the little Subutio game, the, the tabletop soccer game, 
to a certain extent, those players can do whatever you want them to do, but you can't control the actual players no. that are on the pitch. And when they don't live up to your expectations, you hate them with all of the fervor and the passion of a jilted lover or anything like that. I know. You sometimes there there are moments in this film where you see the screaming faces, and it looks like battle scenes. It looks like a war. And then when, of course, the goal goes in, all of the hate's forgotten. Celebration Love time. Love leaping to your feet. This is this is what uh, this is what you came for. Yeah. And just to dovetail that earlier thing, when his father takes him, and finally he's got something that not only connects to him, that creates a passion for him, but it also brings him closer to his father. Finally, he has something that he can bond with, that he can bond with uh, his father. However, football becomes, in a sense, when you are that obsessed, it becomes a solitary experience. Uh, and it becomes also the thing that drives him away, away from, his, from father his father. Again. I know, so, his so father looks, is not, doesn't have the, the fervor. Just as the, the older boy that took me to Chelsea for the very first time, I realized I was hooked. I was uh, exactly as Nick Hornby is. But the boy that took me was not. He was fly by night. So when he didn't want to go, I had to go by myself. And after I'd been by myself a few times, I didn't need anyone anymore. It became a totally solitary experience. Which is weird because it's an experience it's in, within a crowd. You are alone in a crowd of 50,000 people. And yet there's, you know, I mean, one of the things that he does talk about. That but, is Highbury, by the way. We should just point out that. This is Highbury, uh, which does not exist anymore. Um, several years ago, in the uh, mid 2000s, um, Highbury was shuttered, and Arsenal Football Club built a new stadium, approximately one mile from this location, mm. uh, which is called the Emirates Stadium. Um, and so, uh, if Nick Hornby still lives in the area, he has one mile further to go now, because I think he used to live on Avenal Road, which I think is this road right near Arsenal Stadium, which is literally a hundred yards from the gate. This is this is frequently true in with the London teams, the London clubs, though, right? I mean, I I've only ever been to um, Stamford Bridge, the Chelsea Stadium, and that's right. You know, it's surrounded by houses. I and think shops it's true and... to say that there that there is a that they were built that way um, as part of a community. That yes. Originally, these stadiums, many of them were built in the 1800s. Many of them date back to the 1870s and 1880s. Stamford Bridge, which became the home of Chelsea Football Club in 1905, was previously um, a dog track, uh, and it had all sorts of other. Um, applications to it before mm -hmm. before that land became solely Chelsea Football Club. This little boy here, Richard Claxton, um, a couple of years earlier, uh, he became sort of famous for being in Knowing Me, Knowing You with Alan Partridge oh, yes. and Steve Coogan, where he plays a character called Dean in one notorious episode. So uh, he was uh, he was quite a quite a little uh, celebrity at this time. I should also mention the the um, really. Terrific, very uncutesy kid who plays the young Paul is called Luke Aikman, yes. and he's still acting. Um, and and also, I do, I, I do want to mention that this this film is full of you know wonderful performances by a, a bunch of British actors who, if you have any interest in British TV, British movies, you will have seen many many times. Um, Paul's dad, for example, is played by. Neil Pearson, who, I mean, we've all seen him so many, many times. He's very notably in uh, Bridget Jones's Diary, along with Colin Firth, um, and uh, but but also tons and tons of television. And I just love him. This cast, generally speaking, outside of Colin Firth, who, as we know, has gone on to become a major movie star. Um, outside of him and Mark Strong, the others have all really had tremendous television careers, yes. including the director, David Evans, who has worked almost exclusively in television right up to recently being in Downton being Abbey. Director of Downton Abbey. So uh, uh, Ruth Gemmell, uh, too, who plays uh, Sarah, has, um, you know... A, many, a, a, many TV credits. Yeah. This is a thankless role, in my opinion. I, I, I can't say exactly what it is. I don't know if it's performance or if it's the way that it's written... But she is so 
hillish. I think my feeling, and I could be completely wrong. No, I mean, we, we haven't read the screenplay. Um, from reading uh, Mr. Hornby's book a couple of times, I, I think she is an amalgam. I think she's a composite of a yes, number it, of different women who he tried to maybe interest in his passion or who he encountered that were anti, very anti. I mean, very anti, as we said earlier. I, don't, I think it's very difficult, and we'll get into this more as the film goes on with the football stuff, but it's very difficult for people to understand now in the era of the Premier League, which is so rich and so glamorous and so global. It's she-she. That, that in the 70s and 80s, football was a scabrous... It was the people's sport. <laughs> that, that should have been banned. And in fact, the Thatcher government was so anti-football, was so anti the sport, they actually mooted ways to possibly suspend or ban the sport altogether because they thought that it was the epicenter of everything that was wrong with England, the rowdy hooligan, the uh, um, it was a primitive, it was a primitive world where you stood on freezing cold stone steps for hours on end in all weathers, in the rain, oh, in the snow. Can, 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 and people fought each other all the time at these games. And it was not pleasant and it wasn't safe. It was not a place to take families. Now, in the era of the Premier League, it's like going to a Broadway show. Yes. Actually, I just read an article um, uh, about about a recent interview with Nick Hornby, and he made that exact point. He said it is now, he was talking just about the expense. It's now so expensive. He, to go, a single ticket costs sometimes hundreds of pounds. Um, and he remembered being able to go and, and stand on the terraces for 15p. I mean, it, it's hard to believe the, the logarithmic increase in prices, which, of course, prices... Anybody below, you know, the one percent, right out of a ticket. Well, uh, you know, I love looking at um, photographs of football stadiums and and matches that took place in the eighteen eighties, the eighteen nineties, the nineteen hundreds, the nineteen tens, and you see this sea of flat caps. Caps, yeah. Flat caps and the workers' and, caps. And great coats, the workers. That's exactly what it was for. These are people. This is this game was for people who were down the mines or working in the mills, working in the steel yards, in the factories, and the one day they had to blow off steam was the Saturday afternoon when mm. they went, and it was incredibly cheap. They went and they stood and they watched their team. Mm. Um, often uh, in those days, the, uh, the families that owned the factories owned the football team as well. Oh, of course. You'll see that even in rugby. Like I think you're, you're familiar with this sporting life, for example. Yes. That's about rugby, but it's the same principle. It's the workers uh, where their bosses own both their leisure and their work. Or is the, the, I mean. the wealthier were attending cricket matches? Well, cricket was always uh, Tennis, uh, sort maybe. of felt to be a little bit more refined. Um, there's an old joke about football, which is uh, rugby is a game for hooligans played by gentlemen, and that football is a game for gentlemen played by hooligans. That was an old <laughs> adage uh, that lasted for decades and decades and decades. Um, we were listening the other day to Chris Christopherson talking about how he was uh, playing rugby for a league-winning side in the, in the late 1960s, early 1970s when he first moved to California. So rugby was a game that was sort of adopted as something that could be played uh, by, by people that were not necessarily, uh, you know, that sport-oriented. Um, but that football was so insular, so arcane, so of its time and so of its place and of its people that it didn't really translate at all. Um, of course, again, that seems strange, even in America, when every child that you know now plays Play soccer. soccer. You know. But that wasn't the case in the 1970s. And, and certainly, every child wasn't playing soccer in this era in, in the United era. States. Even though in, the, in, in America, in the 1970s, they had an early uh, version of what they call the MLS now, which is the major soccer league. Uh, they, but that talk about arcane. It was. Uh, e even some stars from England, like George Best, for example, played up in San Jose in the 1970s. Good but it, Lord. There, was, there was the New York Cosmos, which was a very famous team, but it didn't catch on. Again, it sort of was like a, like a niche. Yeah. 
but now, uh, now this very year, NBC has the rights to show the Premier League in America. Now, if NBC are going to do it, that means that there's been a major cultural shift. Yes, now they can put country. money on the line. They they feel it's safe. What? By the way, I, I find this, you know, the moment that just occurred on screen, their kiss and now they're going to bed together, completely gobsmacking. To use the vernacular. Well, it's gobsmacking, isn't it, when she says, and you can stay the stay night. Stay the if night. You I'm want. thinking, really? Although it. Uh, and not what... for any moral reasons. It's because has she shown one iota of warmth towards him? Yeah, but again, I'm thinking that's that's part of, again, part of the times, part of what I think has been set up that is she is kind of. She fancies him, you know, in an English expression. She does. We have that expression here. Too. And, when, and when she gets him home, for the first time, she's going to she, keep him there. She makes the offer, uh, and I don't think it's out of love or even out of a tremendous affection. I think it's out of geography. Uh, for pink witty. it's out of yes uh, and proximity. I, I, I think it's you're you're with someone that you're near. I really think that's love a, the a, one you're with and someone that you can actually, in a sense change because I think it's in her mind that, you know, that the football is well, the a first thing a stupid she's, phase that he's going to get out and of. And the first thing she says to her girlfriend is, he's not a yob. Right. And of course, he's not a yob. And Nick Hornby, uh, I love that. Which uh, I love that too, and particularly when he says to her, these aren't my best ones. <laughs> Nick Hornby makes the point in his book that everyone that went to football matches in those days knows, which is in the crowd of 50,000, yes, there were 200 people that were looking for a fight, but it's 200 out of 50,000. The average person who went to a game mm -hmm. was like Paul Ashworth, mm -hmm. you know, a guy who's not going to hit someone, a guy who's not going to throw a brick, you know, or a bottle in someone's face. Uh, he went to watch the game which is what the majority of people did. But so loomed so large did the hooligans that everyone thought that the, that the entire crowd was made up of psychotic people. Yes, I, it reminds me of certain political factions here in this country who are claimed as a large majority when, in fact, they're a teeny minority. Um, this is another wonderful actor playing the headmaster, Ken Stott. And as you might be able to tell from his accent, he is a Scot. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, he's adorable. Um, he's been in all the Hobbit movies, by the way. May I point out for those who are fans. So here's, here's the thing that I find very interesting in light of what you were just saying. In an American romantic comedy... Um, first of all, there would be a lot more delay. Yes. You know, you, you, you wouldn't have them, you know, physically getting together, sometimes till the very, very end. This does have one very important romantic comedy trope, which is the, the antagonism at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, two, the two lovers have to hate each other because, of course, then they're going to love each other, which I always find kind of bizarre. The only time I've ever really seen that is in the movies. I don't know if I've ever encountered that in life, but it remains a big romantic comedy trope. Um, and then the other thing that I think is interesting is, unlike an American romantic comedy, this is a very hard look at relationships and how tough they are and how imperfect they are. And when we get to a couple of later scenes, I think we can talk about that a little bit more. And here's the other thing that I think is very, very interesting, and, and, and a number of the characters will speak about this. Here he is trying to negotiate with his mother to get her to let him go alone to a game. And to, uh, he, he's got the whole schedule worked out. I'll take the train here and then the bus goes there and I'll arrive at the stadium at such and such a point. Did you have to do anything like that? Oh, my mother uh, would have moved heaven and earth for me not to have gone anywhere near a football stadium. She used to say things to me like, you, you know that they will tear the shirt off your back. <laughs> well, well she, she says, this mother here who, again, another great actress, Lorraine Ashbourne, she's been on TV a million times. She's terrific. Anyway, she says to her son, um, you know, you're going to go get stabbed. Yeah. You'll and then get she stabbed. says, don't come to me when you get stabbed. And he says, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> 
I also like, look, the changing fashions. She's got all this long hair now, and so does he. I, I love the way he looks in this film. Look at the long collars, the long hair now. And you'll see he's walking along with his, you know, his shoes that have a little bit of a heel on yes. them. You know, it's yes. very... Because this is a little bit later. We're now getting into the 70s, 70s where it's all sort of clog heels and that kind of thing. Um, I guess Nick Hornby and I are very close in age. I think he's a year or two younger. So, um, but, this is but, your but, era. But it's still very, very close to to my own experience, even though he's just a little bit smaller. Um, the idea of going by yourself, and, and of course it's interesting that when he goes with his father initially, they sit, they sit in the stands, yes. as they're called. Um, but when he goes by himself, he wants to graduate to the North Bank, which is the large terrace, which is where people are densely packed. You know and what? Where just, all of the chanting and singing fans. Just are. for for American audiences who may not have been to an English football stadium, certainly of this era, tell us what the terraces are, because I think they are unique to football slash soccer. I don't know of another American game that has them. Well, um, I think if you were to go back to the turn of the 20th century, back to the 1900s, I think that the stadiums were almost all terraces. In other words, all no stone steps with, with, with metal stanchions that were sort of like crush barriers um, so that it would stop people from literally falling over when there was a surge from the back down to the front. I don't think that stands ironically named for where people sit, mm -hmm. were actually built until a little bit later. And that was almost a kind of a class demarcation because the people that were able to pay a bit more paid for the privilege of sitting down. Sitting down. But huge areas of all football stadiums right through the beginning of the 1990s in England, more people stood than sat. And people wanted to stand. And the reason that you wanted to stand is because when you were crushed together with all of that rolling mass of humanity, you felt the kind of communal power, the roar, if you like, the animal force of a huge group of people who all want the same thing. This is something that you don't encounter much in life. Everyone there wants the same thing. And and I will. T it's so amazing to me that you would put it in those words because one of the things that Paul slash Nick Hornby says in the film is you care for the same people and hope for the same things. That's how he defines the family of football. Right. And it's a truer family than your own. I mean, this is all cliched stuff, of course, but you you find your family. In other words, you you choose your family. The family that you have is the family that you have, whether you get on with them or not. Um, you look for a communal family. Uh, people can turn to religion. People can turn to a, a cult. People can turn to... Uh, anything uh, where you feel that there are like-minded people. Um, and I think it's certainly true that standing on the terraces in that period, in the 60s and the 70s and into the 80s, um, you didn't really have anything in common. I know I didn't feel like I had. I felt like I had nothing in common as I stood there alone in this heaving mass of people. I felt that I had nothing in common with any of them except I wanted Chelsea to win. I didn't mm. have any other desire. You don't have any other desire. You don't think about anything else except, are Chelsea going to win? That is all I care about. Can I, can I ask you, did, did you never feel an impulse to like ask someone to go with you or a friend or something? I actually felt that it would be an encumbrance to have people with me because it's like, why would I want to... Uh, we're going to talk extensively about the scene that is later in the film where he takes Sarah and makes her stand on the North Bank, which is an intimidating experience and an unpleasant one for her. Um, I, I would never have done that. I mean, I not only would never, I wouldn't have brought, I mean, there were times when I did bring, you know, I would say to a friend of mine, do you want to come? They'd say, oh, yes, you know, we'll come. We'll see if we like it. They would come. They would tolerate it. They, would, they might even enjoy it marginally. But they would never want to come again. Um, this is a far cry from the people who lived, and I mean lived, to be there. And I was one of those people. You get there 
just as just as young Paul says, you, I, he, he's obsessed about getting there at two o'clock. That's a full hour before the game kicks off. You mm -hmm. want to be standing in your place at two o'clock when the play, when it's almost empty, and then around you, you imagine it being like a time lapse photography With around the you. Gathering. It fills up until you cannot see anything except the heads and the shoulders and the, and the overwhelming smell and the overwhelming smell. And anyone that went will know what that smell is, a very particular smell of sweat, of body odor. But, wet but, wool. But of wet wool, but of hamburgers, the cheap hamburgers that people would buy from the, um, the vendors outside, the hot dogs uh, and beer, of course, because everybody was absolutely paralytically drunk as well <laughs> at the same time. So you had a heaving mass of drunken, working-class people, aggressive, yes, uh, although the aggressive was the aggression was very rarely turned on on Each your other. own people. You didn't turn, but you know, um, the away fans would always be at the other end. Yes, of the I think I find that interesting that that the the two sides would be segregated in terms of seating. But there wasn't the in terms of the standing, but the but the crowd control was not there. That's there today. Today they have all kinds of CCTV, and and the, and and the terraces the, are gone. The terraces are gone. It's much harder to start a fight in the seats. Although it has happened, uh, it happened uh, in a big game recently, just within the last couple of years uh, uh, in England. It just shows you that if the circumstances are right, and they'll tear up the seats, they'll pull the seats out of their stand, and they'll start throwing the seats at people. I mean, that's that has happened. Uh, you're not going to be able to stamp out that level of aggression ever. Well, uh, can I ask you something? Because, you know, every once in a while, very rarely, I would say that the American equivalent to English football is baseball. The most devoted fans, and in fact, this movie was remade uh, by the Farrelly brothers with Jimmy Fallon as a Red Sox fan. Uh, it, quite successfully, too. It's quite good, and and, and there are certainly comparisons. Um, but only rarely have I heard stories about fans going crazy and beating each other up. There was one very serious uh, incident a few years ago at Dodger Stadium, but that stood out for its complete rarity. Um, what do you think it is or was that engendered that level of, of actual physical violence? There have been a lot of theories over the years. I mean, even uh, um, esteemed people like Dr. Desmond Morris have written books, anthropological studies on the nature of this human behavior. Uh, there was a book called The Football Man by Arthur Hopcroft in 1971 that tried to put everything into perspective. Um, there are sort of all sorts of th silly theories like... Um, uh, well, it's because we hadn't been involved in a war for a long time, that, uh, and because of England is such a warlike, you know, nation. Unless there's a war to fight, they're going to have to find some way to do it. England, well, I shouldn't say England. There is a level of aggression in the average British male that I think. A lot of people in other countries find shocking. It's not that it doesn't exist in other countries. It's not that it doesn't exist. And everybody exist talks about how, you know, Americans are the most violent people in the world. Well, I think but, but it's a very different thing here, and it's something that I've learned. I mean, I, I, I moved from England to America in the late 1980s. I came, exact, I came from this environment to here, and I found America sort of genteel. Now, that is not to say that <laughs> there aren't gangs that shoot each other with AK-47s and that there isn't a high murder rate or anything like that. But what you don't seem to find or what I never found or I was surprised to find is that you don't have people spilling out of pubs at closing time with bottles and chains, roaring drunk, looking to kick someone's head in, which is exactly the kind of common or garden urban violence that existed in Britain all that time and still does. Um, and it was epicentered in football matches because you could say, well, it drew the most primarily aggressive of people and they had a, quote, common enemy. The enemy was the opposing team's mm. fan. And when the opposing... It's like Braveheart. When the opposing team's fans come into your community, 
uh, it is like an invasion. And when that team has the temerity to win or those opposing team's fans have the temerity to hurl insults at you, which, of course, they always did, mm -hmm. and the insults went back and forth, and then the insults turned into um, what you would call antisocial crowd behavior, which is where one group of young men would charge into another group of young men, mm. and a melee would ensue that would often involve 100 or 200 people. Mm. And then it would spill out onto the roads afterwards and yes. the fights would continue all the way down the street to the tube stations yes, I, and I on, think on the tube stations, on the station, in the trains and, I, and all I, over the place. I remember you're actually telling me that, that the trains were dangerous after a match. The trains were dangerous. The stations were dangerous because anyone familiar with the British tube system knows that these are very narrow steps that you go down and the platforms are very, very narrow. Um, and there's not much space from the wall to where you would fall off the platform onto the line. Imagine those platforms being literally jammed with hundreds and hundreds of hyper-aggressive people, drunk young men, and then the opposing team's fans happen to converge there at the same look, time. Just look at how he's walking here. Yeah. It, he looks like he's spoiling for it. Well, he, he is. Obviously, this young man... Paul in the film and Nick Hornby in reality was not going to get into a fight if he could possibly help it. Right. I, I very rarely ever got into a fight, but sometimes fights would erupt around you that you couldn't control, control. the fights that were yeah. going on around you. You just happened to be there when they were going on. What he's doing is kind of, in a sense, psyching himself up because this is going to be now he's going by himself. Now he's standing on the North Bank. Mm. Now he's with them. He's with the ferocious. He there is are those with the, burgers you were talking that's about. Exactly, it. and that's the smell. That's what you smelled all the time. Uh, so he is psyching himself up to be not someone who's going to commit an act of violence, but he is going to be very much a part of the communal force, if you like, the ferocious energy that is going to be centered on his team and his team. So can I, and here's the scene where, you know, people are gathering, you know, beforehand. Yes, you get there early, the place is empty, uh, and he's bringing her. He wants to prove to her that this is going to be an exciting experience. She doesn't know what she's going to be in for. This is actually a pretty, I think, Brilliantly successful cut part because sequence. you're going to see young Paul enjoying his first North Bank experience. You're going to see the older Paul who that hasn't changed. That does look scary. I'm sorry. That looks changed. scary to me. Well, and everyone tumbled down like that because you were pushed from behind. You had nowhere to go but further down. And your fear was always, am I going to fall over? Because if you fell, You'd you would be, be trampled. You, you would be trampled. But it was remarkable, amazing, how few people ever fell in, in those uh, crushes. And those crushes would be quite... Quite scary. Well, there was no room to fall. <laughs> now, what what Nick Hornby is doing here in the screenplay is he's cleverly he's cleverly putting together three things, actually four things: young Paul enjoying the North Bank for the first time, older Paul demonstrating that he has not changed, that his mm -hmm. passion and his fervor and the ferociousness of the crowd is as very much a part of him as a man as it was as a boy. Yes, he has introduced his girlfriend to it. She doesn't like football. She thinks all of these people are insane. And now she's going to be right there in a sea of people that she can't control. And she is going to be literally buffeted by these constant waves. And that's a very unpleasant, can be terrifying and frightening experience. And then the fourth element is Hillsborough. it's all taking place on the day that the very worst football tragedy in British football history would take place, the 15th of April, 1989, where at Hillsborough Stadium, uh, which is the home of Sheffield Wednesday, they were hosting an FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. And before the game began, nearly 100 Liverpool fans were killed, crushed to death in the worst stadium disaster in history. And now, after the game that they were at is over, they are home watching 
the newsreel yeah. footage of why the game was abandoned at Hillsborough, which I believe caused the death, I think I'm right in saying 96. 96 people, 96. including one who died like eight years later. Yes, 96 Liverpool fans. And the inquest of Hillsborough has gone on and on and on. And here we sit in the year 2014. And only in the last year or so, I think that the... Liverpool fans have been finally, their names have been cleared. This was all about the families trying to clear the names of their loved ones. The men, women and children that were killed in that disaster, because of the way people thought of football, they naturally thought somehow the fans must have caused this themselves. Hooligans somehow caused this tragedy. No. Nothing could be further from the truth. This was, this was the accident literally that had been waiting to happen for decades. And there had been incidents like it before, some even going back to the 1940s, one very famous one in Scotland at Ibrox in 1971, where some Scottish fans were crushed to death when some crush barriers fell and they were fallen upon by other people. Part of the stadium, part of the stand actually fell. Um, Hillsborough was a unique, horrible disaster, and it brought the 80s, everything that the Thatcher government had hated about football. They had introduced identity cards. They wanted everyone that went to football matches to be tagged and branded. Ooh. They wanted them to be herded, and the police and security forces at these grounds um, felt that they had the right to do anything, and they treated the people like animals. I'll never forget, after one Stamford Bridge game, seeing a huge graffiti on a wall near the stadium saying, if you treat us like animals, we're going to act like animals. And this is what happened at Hillsborough. The police, instead of opening up some... There were, there were pens that were closed where there was nobody standing. Instead of opening up those empty pens that would have allowed the overflow to run to into running. all of those pens, they tried to force all of these Liverpool supporters into this overcrowded end. Yeah. And with fences down at the front preventing people from invading the pitch because one of the reasons that all of these stadiums started to have fences built at the bottom of the terraces is because of people running onto the pitch. They didn't want them to do that. So you can imagine as the pressure builds from the back, all of the people down the front are just going to get squashed. And you see here, Paul, uh, he's teary about it. It's not that he cares about Liverpool or, or anything to do with it. He cares about the game. But what every football fan felt uh, on that day, and I was in America on that day, 15th of April, 89, mm. but you, you remember all of the times when you were in such a terrifying crush, you think... <laughs> That could have been me. So everyone, everyone felt compassion and sympathy for the Hillsborough disaster because everyone knew that any football fan, it could have happened anywhere, anytime to anybody. And for those Liverpudlian families to have had to have spent 20 years clearing their name is a, is a, is a shocking outrage that finally um, has been remedied. Of course, it's never going to bring those... Uh, families back, the family members that died back, but, um, you know, some, some kind of closure they've, they have finally received. But um, I, I remember a, a time in 1978 at Stamford Bridge at Chelsea played Orient. It was an FA Cup fifth round replay. And about 45 minutes before the game, the turnstiles were closed, or there was one person operating the turnstile. So you went down this narrow, uh, sort of ginnel, they used to call them, an alleyway to get to the turnstiles. The gates were locked, and then you had to get up steps to go over the top down into the bowl of Stamford Bridge with one person operating the, t the turnstiles mm. and everybody trying to get in. I remember probably for about 20 minutes, my feet never touched the ground, <gasps> and there is, nothing, there is nothing worse than being off the ground for that length of time, knowing that why aren't they opening the gates? Why aren't they doing this? How many more people are going to come in behind us? Someone is going to die. You know, you are fearful. Uh, you are in an utter situation that cannot be controlled. Eventually, they opened the gates and everybody poured in without paying. Had they not done that, there would have been deaths that night. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that 
any football fan listening to this, anybody who ever stood on the terraces ever anywhere from the 60s, 70s and 80s would have had a comparable experience that could have resulted in something like Hillsborough. But it was unfortunate that Hillsborough came right on the heels of the Bradford fire disaster, which is where a, st a stand caught fire and mm. many people died trying to get out of the inferno. That was in 1985. Uh, in the same year, 85, there was the Heisel Stadium disaster in Brussels, which yes. is where a wall collapsed, crushing uh, many, many fans. Um, then you had Hillsborough, and the end result of this was the Taylor Report, a government report that basically said, no more. This cannot go on. These stadiums are absolutely unfit. Unsafe, yeah. They are unsafe. And they were. We we're talking about stadiums that were built in the 1880s, some of them, that had no facilities, no restaurants, no bars, no toilets, no nothing. I mean, this you couldn't imagine a more primitive, primitive. <laughs> uh, place as, as these stadiums were. Some were better than others. Stamford Bridge, Chelsea's ground, was a bit on the rotten side was an old crumbling thing. But the Taylor report was the thing that finally said, we're going to have to make a change. And the change was that these stadiums are going to have to become all-seater. All mm -hmm. Now, it does not extend all the way down the league to all of the other um, teams, but it's really all of the Premier League teams and certainly all of the championship teams, which is the league below the Premier League, they've all got to have stadiums that, that are... that. Now pass with a seats code. And, and not terraces. And they are, and they are all just just as a little point for the film, you know, they wanted to replicate the um, uh, the Highbury Terrace, um, and they had to go go to Fulham to yes. Craven Cottage to find terraces. That's right. Well, because by the time this film was made, which is that was I believe ninety seven. It was released in ninety seven, so it would have been shot in ninety six. Uh, at that time, that was the exact time when. Stadiums were having end by end, side by side, demolished, all the terraces knocked down and stadiums built. Because it took years. It took years to do it. Um, and then, of course, uh, Nick Hornby's book was published in the year 1992, which was the very year that the Premier League began. And, of course, the Premier League would be the thing that would change the social stigma if all of the fighting mobs were going to be priced out of going to football mm -hmm. and the stadiums were going to be safe, they were going to be all-seater and you could finally take your girlfriend and you could take your family and you could take your children. And, and you can stay in the hotel that was attached and you can stay to in the... the hotel, yeah. And you could eat in the restaurants. Yes. This was going to be a whole different but, of course, much more expensive experience than what went before. The social stigma has gradually gone away uh, in the era of the Premier League, but so has everything that made football, football has gone to. And someone like a Nick Hornby, who has been a week-in, week-out Arsenal supporter uh, from a time he was 11 right through presumably to today in 2014, mm -hmm. he will have seen changes so great that it is almost like a different universe. The universe that he inhabited as a child is now utterly different from what he inhabits as a mature man because the heaving, ferocious, singing, chanting forces of those, you know, drunken, aggressive young men has been replaced by, the last time you and I went to Stamford Bridge, has been replaced by businessmen from around the world mm -hmm. who fly... Uh, from anywhere to come to a game to pay inordinate uh, prices for hospitality tickets. It's, it, and it's an, it's an entertainment center. It's an entertainment Stanford center, Bridge. yes, yeah. as is every every ground. I actually heard that uh, Highbury got turned into apartments. They built apartments within that sort of, it looks like an art deco facade of the stadium. Uh, and, of course, they're for the very wealthy. It, just to go back to, <laughs> to what's on screen, just for a moment, and 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 I, I will say the fact that we have been talking about all this rather dark stuff points up again how, although I maintain this is a romantic comedy, it's a very particularly English one in that it is dark. It has a dark side, and it's very serious about certain issues, and therefore. 
you know, it, again, in this very clever Hornby script, the stakes keep escalating, even as, you know, the his wretched slash beloved team is doing better and better over this season. The stakes are being raised for him. He's been offered a uh, a, a promotion, essentially. And now it, he's found out that his girlfriend is pregnant. Which is going to have consequences. Even, even this is sort of dark mm -hmm. because her pregnancy is causing a rift between them. He's going to lose the possible promotion that he had coming to him because of it too. Yes. Um, there is a bittersweet uh, aspect to their relationship throughout. And in the end, uh, not much of a spoiler alert, when they sort of seem like they're getting together, one, I don't feel that they're going to be together that long, you know. They seem to disagree about most about things. About everything. About everything. And if, you know, wh when they're bantering about it, you can kind of go, oh, that's sweet. But I will also say that I think that the two major arguments that they have in this film, one of which ha or happens on the day of um, the Hillsborough disaster, and then another which is still upcoming, those are two of the most bitter arguments that I've ever seen in almost any movie. They are so kind of nakedly out there with the home truths and with the two of them saying those things that you instantly wish you could take back but can never take back. You know, she at one point says something about him making her sick. And, I mean, th really wretched, horrible things, and he, he's very insulting to For her. those that don't know, that's yes. Nick Hornby <laughs> <coughs> playing the opposition coach. Yeah, yeah, the coach whose team is, is losing 8-0, <laughs> about to be 9-0. And he, he, Colin Firth here is very amusingly telling his team to, like, you know, take it down a notch. <laughs> So, you know, now she's mad at him yet again. Um, and she has not yet been what her wonderful roommate, played by Holly Aird, um, calls. She has not been colonized. And she says this, and I actually I think most women can relate to it, to this, that men have a way of colonizing women with their interests. They at least try and sometimes it actually works. And in the case of Paul, it's already worked with his mother and his sister um, and various, you know, friends and other relations, one assumes. Everybody associates with him, with him with his team, and everybody's very happy and anxious to talk to him about it. And um, his, his mother and sister in particular have been sort of his enablers in it and become fans themselves. And as we see as this plays out, um, they almost share his interest in Arsenal. And I do think, don't you think that's true? I think it's true. I think, I think if um, some people will, you know, it, it is possible to develop uh, uh, an interest uh, in something because the person that you're with is interested in something. You know, I think it's, and I think also from uh, the mother's point of view, it's a it's a way to bond with him if you show yes. an interest, because the father uh, and Nick Hornby's actual father is living in France with a completely different family. He's only mm -hmm. coming over periodically, so which is why we said that his original going was sort of a solitary experience. But he's He's co-opted friends and family into his obsession, which is quite believable. It is. She's very, very funny. She, when she's talking about the colonization, she says, you know, men, they're like missionaries. They, they drive out the native culture and they bring in a whole bunch of other stuff and then they take off, um, which I think is most amusing. On the other hand, you know... I, I think you said it's bonding when the mother and sister um, develop the interest or, or allow themselves to become interested in Arsenal. I think, you know, for um, for boyfriend and girlfriend, it's equally important to have that kind of bonding. And if you are with someone who absolutely adores a particular sports team, it behooves you to find out what's so interesting about it. Yes, uh, but but you can also gen genuinely develop an interest. End up becoming interested, yeah. Um, 
Perhaps we should point out, I mean, this is obviously the the running narrative of the film outside mm -hmm. of the rom-com aspect, is that this is all about one particular season in Arsenal's history. A biggie. The 88-89 season, which would see Arsenal win the championship for the first time since 1971. Arsenal, for those that don't know, is one of the most famous and oldest and well-established of the London clubs, it was has a very storied history, particularly in the 1930s, right through this time had had been a bit up and down uh, in the 1960s and 70s. They had won the double in 1971, which means that they won the league title and they won the FA Cup in the same year, which is something that happened very infrequently. Um, and then there had been 18 years of being in the wilderness through which Paul in the film and Nick Hornby in reality had suffered through every moment of those 18 years of, you know, lack of success. I believe you had a similar period with Chelsea. Well, um, the 1980s was not a good decade for Chelsea. When I started seeing Chelsea in the late 1960s, they were sort of a glamorous, fairly successful team. Uh, they were situated near the King's Road. Uh, Steve McQueen and Raquel Welch and other American movie stars would come to the games. There was a sort of a, there was a bit of a, a, a cachet about Chelsea, mostly because of the geography of where they were. Yes, uh, Chelsea, we should say is one of the most beautiful areas of London, right near the river. But they, uh, you, you know, the um, the King's Road of that period was the jumping place with the uh, uh, all of the boutiques. Swinging the, 60s, Mary Quant. Exactly. And, and the football team was very much a part of that. However, the 70s uh, began to see an unraveling of the club. Mm -hmm. And by the mid-1970s, Chelsea had been relegated to the second division. And then they spent the next decade yo-yoing up and down between the first and the second division. And the early 1980s was perhaps one of the most dire periods. By the periods. way, let's, let's just, just take, pull off to the side for one second and just look at, look at the screen. This is Highbury, right? Yes. Okay, so this is the stadium. And he, they are now looking for a, a house together. Yes. How would you like to live that close? Yes. It's actually a terrific house. It is. Right on the corner. Uh, you know, that, that was every football fan's dream, that you would sort of tumble out of bed and you'd be in the stadium. I mean, no, nothing could have been more attractive than that idea. I, in fact, I, I, our friend Richard Williams yes. could basically do that when he was a kid because he lived, remember, in that little new street I, I, just around I, the corner from the bridge. I, I will say, though, that, that place in Chelsea, I would happily live there. And I enjoy football, but I wouldn't call myself a diehard fan. And I could see the problems of living near the stadium, but that little close right next in Chelsea is so beautiful. So at this point in 1988-89, we're now in the month of May 89, which is the last month of the league season. And of course, that season was extended as a result of the Hillsborough disaster, which mm. caused, you know, I mean... Although football was going to continue after Hillsborough, there is that feeling that everyone has, that sinking feeling of sort of like maybe this is the end. Maybe maybe we should just stop going. You know, maybe maybe we should stop going. I remember feeling that even in 1985 after the Heisel disaster. It's like maybe we should just stop, you know. But, of course, two weeks later, when your team is playing at home again, you're there again. You go. <laughs> uh, and it's as if nothing nothing ever happened. And that's what he's feeling at the moment. He's the bittersweet memory of the Hillsborough disaster, which cast a huge pall over football in general. But the fact that his team is closing in on something that it hasn't achieved for nearly two decades. And uh, this is a huge point in the film. You I love know, the way that the real estate agent lies about how he says, oh, they only play they once play a month. They play once a month. Uh, and, and they don't make much noise. And, they're, uh, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, um, but anyway, the point about the 18 years is a big one in this film because one of the arguments consistently between the two of them is he thinks it's a great thing to love the things that you've always loved, that it's a great thing to want something for 18 years, to be that devoted and that loyal. And I really see that argument. She says... Well, you know, I don't want the same things I wanted 18 years ago because I still I don't want to marry David Cassidy anymore. Right. Um, 
but she, I think she's being flippant and he's being sincere. And I just wanted to throw this out to you, and you're going to think I'm crazy. That part of the film actually reminds me of Equus, the themes of Equus, where, you know, it talks about how obsessions fall together in your mind, and you're not really sure why those particular things, but you know that they're important. Yes. Uh, this is a lighter way of dealing with a similar thing, and it's what uh, Nick Hornby always writes about, whether it's high fidelity music or even about a boy, which is about a guy who just doesn't like to give up his gadgets and his TV and his, all his pop culture stuff. Mm. This character uh, that Stephen... Rhea, Ray. Or Ray. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. I think Rhea it's or Ray. Ray. I um, think it's Ray, but I could be wrong. A good actor. Uh, came to prominence in Neil Jordan films mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the 80s. He's funny in the scene. He's very funny, but I don't buy that character for one second. It, it doesn't seem he's real Well, he's me. very jocular. and. But but his... his, his his turning the interview into a into a conversation about Arsenal seems a little far fetched, but it but it makes certain points, and we know what's going to happen here, which is that you know he's not going to he's get not going to get the job, and he knows it. At the end of the scene, you see the look on his face, and the look on his face is well, that's that. <laughs> but he's such a funny rubber face guy, and yet he's cute. I really love him. Yeah, he's in the crying game. Uh, the pundit on television there is Ian St. John, who was a very famous player for Liverpool in the 1960s, and he had a show called Saint and Greavesy. His partner was Jimmy Greaves, who was another very famous player from the 60s and 70s, and for a half an hour each Saturday, everybody tuned in to Saint and Greavesy oh. to hear what they would have to say about the the coming games, the games that would be played later that day. Of course, again, in an era that predated the internet uh, and any kind of communication, your television reports and the back pages of the newspapers was, mm -hmm. was literally all, all you had. And no games, hardly any games were shown live in this period either. It was mostly highlights. There was a theory that if you showed the whole games, people wouldn't go anymore. So right. you only showed highlight shows. So if you really wanted to see your team play, you had you to, go. to go. Out. And of course, there was no trouble getting tickets then, because you could just roll up at the door, and and pay and go in. You know, it wasn't like today where you know you have to plan four months, months in ahead advance. to yes. try to get a ticket to Chelsea. Now it's like it's like a military operation <laughs> trying to figure out how to get one. Um, this was uh, in, in a world where you. As we said, you know, he wanders out of his flat. He walks up the street. He's in the ground, you know. And there he is. And this is a bad day because this just is, at the moment where they're ahead in the table, they lose a game at home. Yes. Arsenal that they have should two, have won. Arsenal have two home games against Derby, and I think it's Sheffield Wednesday. I'm not sure the second game. And they lose this one, and then they draw the second one. So the easy chance that they had to wrap the title up is gone, and it leaves the whole thing to come down to one game, ironically, Liverpool away in the last game of the season where Arsenal are not just, they not only have to win, they have to win by two goals. Two, and that's very important. It's very important because at that time, Liverpool were far and away, you know, what people think of Manchester United now, it was Liverpool. Liverpool were then. And the, and the idea of going to Anfield, Liverpool Stadium, and not only winning, but I mean actually winning by, by two, two, was science fiction, which is why... Um, all of the newspapers and everybody is saying there's a, there's no no chance, chance in hell. Know, yeah. and no matter how much the committed impassioned fan believes in miracles but he you, doesn't you don't believe you know and, you and frankly he doesn't believe in miracles he really doesn't from here on his position is one of utter fatalism which i think provides some of the funniest stuff in the entire Movie. And again, going back to our structure, uh, our sort of odd screenplay structure of this, mm -hmm. we're, we're, um, we are still with a half an hour of the film to go, and we're coming up to that fatal day. In other words, we're, we're, this film is 102 minutes long, and structurally, here we are, where basically the climax is going to last a half an hour. And yet, um, it doesn't feel like we are 
rushing or running to any kind of conclusion. Really. Which I like because it, it makes sense to me. Everybody who was watching this, certainly in England, knew what the end was going to be as far as Arsenal was concerned. Everybody knew that Arsenal had triumphed in the end. But what's going to happen to these two? It doesn't seem possible at this point. This is another one of the arguments. This is the one that is so very bitter, in which basically they attack each other's characters. And this is the one, and they, they say things that, that to me are just like completely unforgivable. This is where he says to her, maybe one day you'll learn to, to, to care about something you can't tick, which is horrifying. And and again, this this is also the scene where he says, "People need to care about things. People need to have their obsessions." And and this is where I think also the film sort of expands, because he I think he actually says says in the, in this scene, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be football. It could be you know. Music. It could be an Oscar. It, it you know, it mm. could be the baby that they are about to be parents of, or sometime soon. Um, the important thing is to care, and basically, what he's saying to her is, "You don't care." And basically, what she's saying to him is, "You're an infant." You know, and then they conclude they can't go on; that it'll never work out. And she is real snotty about it, too. Yes. He seems tortured, and she just seems like, hmm. Well, the interesting thing here is that she's pregnant, but yes. she doesn't know if she's going to have an abortion or not. She says no, at this she's... point, I think she's gone past that. But, I mean, but we don't, but that's my feeling. We don't, have the, we, don't, we don't have her moment of deciding that, do we? So it's, is it, no. still, it still but they are looking. The but they were looking for a house together, which seems to indicate that they're going to have a baby, have the baby. Plus, you know, she's, they, their school now knows that she's going to have a baby. So I think the abortion is a, is a thing of the past, but... But you don't ever feel with this character, Sarah, that she really wants, you don't really feel that she wants a future with Paul, do you? Well, I don't, and I think that's a serious flaw in the movie. But again, look at Colin Firth. It's a very warm face, even when he's angry. This man, John Wells, the actor who became very famous impersonating Margaret Thatcher's husband, Dennis. Dennis. Which he did for Poor years Dennis. And years. <laughs> he made Dennis into an unbelievable caricature. Oh, dear. But yes, that is the flaw of the film. You sort of want, I suppose, in a way, you want to um, applaud the fact that it is not following the traditional course, let's say. Yes. But then it would have been more honest, in a sense, for them to have broken up, wouldn't it? And leave him with his passion of Arsenal winning rather than the sort of happy ending that we do get. Well, and, and, and I will tell you, right at that point is where the movie goes into total romantic comedy trope territory. You know, it's got the mad dash to get to your man, which is then very amusingly scotched. Um, and, you know, he, he's very sad and there is like a, a, a really nice couple of little things that happen here in, in what is essentially a montage. He's depressed about everything. There, there's a, there's a lovely song. And by the way, typical of, of, um, of of Nick Hornby, you know, who's written so much about music, and I mean, he's an essayist about pop music, mm. apart from everything else, and has written some of the best things about that ever. There are a lot of really, really good songs in this film, um, you know, by the Pretenders and the Who and the Smiths and mm. so forth. So, you know, there's a traditional romantic song. Here she's, you know, feeling a little sick from being pregnant um anyway so she, she, her interest even as she separated from him even af after she's excoriated him about his football passion she is maintaining an interest now all of a sudden all on her own somehow her interest has been caught and it's partly to do with him 
but even without him breathing down her neck, she's interested in what's going to happen. And then in this scene, this is, this, this is so slight. I didn't notice it the first time I saw it. He says out the side of his mouth, he says, miss you, hmm. really quietly. And, 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 and so you have all of these points converging here. What's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to Arsenal? And now add to it what is going to happen to the school team that he's coaching. They're now in the championships, and, and here comes the last game of the season. <clears throat> and um, so I actually think it's, it's really fascinatingly structured and – the one problem is, and and perhaps this is because it was invented out of whole cloth, it's not really part of the book, the memoir of Fever Pitch, is why, I'm not sure why these two people are, are together, except, as you said, it's a kind of propinquity issue. This is, this is the person I can get because, you know, this is who I run into at my workplace. It's interesting, too, that I, you know, I think that she thinks that Paul is sort of kind of like the guy who she would end up with if only he wasn't crazy. If only yeah. she could fix him. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, when Hillsborough happens, she even has like a little moment like, like she's so relieved. She goes, well, that's it. Mm. Nobody's going to go back. And she's shocked when he says, of course, we're going to go back. We have to go back. We'll all go back. And she thought maybe this was going to be her her out, her way out of this problem. And th this is this is a very sweet moment. He's the one kid on the team who has the guts yes. to to take the kick. And <laughs> of course, as we'll see, oopsie. And uh, I, I totally buy the, the conversation bargain. that he has with uh, the It's like a bargain boy. with God. Yes, because because you cling on to any kind of a superstitious belief. Um, in fact, uh, toward the end of the film, in voiceover, Paul will say that he no longer feels that Arsenal's fortunes are tied to his own. I still, to this day, believe that if Chelsea are doing well, I'm doing well. And when they do badly, I'm doing badly. How, why is that? How funny. I would never have known that. <laughs> <laughs> but why do I think such a stupid thing? I don't know. But, but the superstition right here... Uh, where he, he says, where he you says, know, would you, you know, trade exactly. this screw-up for... Arsenal winning tomorrow. And the kid goes, of course. And so he says, okay, that's it. But the truth is, he says that, I really think, to make the kid feel better. Yes. He doesn't believe it himself, as we'll see. His hangdog f feelings about the team are just so funny. And so, and I will say this, having known you for many, many years now, um, you you go into each game not with a sense of optimism, but with a sense of darkest pessimism. Here's this this montage with the love song that is applied both to his romance with her and to his romance with his team. Yes, you know the many bad moments. The bad moments. Alan Clark scoring for Leeds in the seventy two FA Cup final, which Arsenal lost. I was sure you could identify all this. And then you're going to see in a moment Charlie George scoring the winning goal for Arsenal in the 71 Cup final. And you should exp perhaps explain who the people in the yellow and blue are, not in the red and white. Well, at Liverpool are in the red and Arsenal are in the yellow playing in their away shirts. That was Charlie George scoring the winning goal in the 71 final, um, which was the, the year that he looks back on with such fondness, fondness. Because that was the 18 years ago when things were all going right. And now it's you know now it's 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 the land of eternal misery and and as you say there is this connection you know when things are going bad for him things go bad for his team or wait is it that when things are going bad for his team things go bad for him and I also think this is very sweet all his students as they're filing out they're saying hey it's going to be great you know they love him 
They do love him. Uh, you know, he's a very popular man. He's got the common touch, as they say. You know, he has the ability to... Yep. That's one of the things that she, Sarah, I She's think... She's jealous. Jealous. Absolutely. That's the thing. A lot of her motivation is envy. She's, she's competitive with him about this. And, you know, she just doesn't... She's not a natural people person. And an insecurity. And that's why it's kind of touching in the end when when, the, when her own class gives her a gift yes. and says that they re, that she reminds them of George Graham, who, who was is, then the Arsenal manager. And, and had a reputation for being... A doer and, you know, mean, uh, but sort of ruggedly, doggedly efficient, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I think that would describe Sarah. <laughs> I would call her doer, mean, and ruggedly efficient. <laughs> <laughs> you know, George Graham had been, uh, you know, he was a Scot. He had played for Arsenal. You know, in fact, he featured in that montage that we saw. We saw a couple of shots of him as a player for Arsenal, and then he was the manager. Um, it's interesting when you think it's like this is the events that were the film was made in 1996, released in 97. We're looking at events that took place in 1989, and that is 25 years ago. Yes, and has Arsenal won a championship? Arsenal since then? has won a championship since. In fact, Arsenal have been very successful under their current manager, the Frenchman, Arsene, Arsene Wenger, Wenger, who has been there since 1996, the year that this film was made. Wow. Arsenal, and he's still there 18 years later. And right now, they are locked in a title chase, almost in a dead heat with, with Chelsea, Chelsea and Manchester City for this year's Premier League title. By the way, I've heard that those bouquets were actually given to Liverpool fans in memory of uh, Hillsborough. Yes. God, that Hillsborough thing was so awful. Yeah. So this, this, this scene to me is the pluperfect example of the insanity that takes hold to the point that Mark Strong's character at one point says to Colin Firth, Paul, you need medical help. Um, because he just, you know, he'll say things like, oh, isn't that just like Arsenal? We need two so they score one to get us going. It, it makes absolutely no sense. And, of course, here she is at the party for her, that her students are throwing, wearing Arsenal colors. Yes. And, and kind of saying, come on, I'm sure somebody here wants to turn on the game. You know, I never made that connection. Wearing Arsenal colours. You're right. I didn't. I did not ever connect that. Well, I of course noticed the dress. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice dress, actually. I think it's a very she nice dress. But something happens later that really bugs me, which is she leaves the party to go do the typical rom com. I'm running towards my man scene. Yes. And she has nothing with her. No purse. No. Nothing. And yet she hails a taxi. Not even. How's she going to pay it? Not even the gift. She doesn't the... take the gift. That's right. Really bugs me. Um, she does look very good in that dress, though. I have to say, that's a very good look. It's for a very her. girly dress. It's the prettiest dress she wears in the whole movie. Plus, it's red and white. Um, just a little bit of Arsenal backstory, um, just to show that uh, even as a Chelsea supporter, I know quite a lot about our North London rivals. Well, because it's that's a derby, isn't it? It's a derby. But after they won this title in 89, they won it again in 91. Under Arsene Wenger in 1998, they won the double. Look, again. Even the cat has a scarf. Absolutely. They won the title again, I believe, in 2002, and they last won it in 2004. So now we're 10 years on. So I'm sure that Nick Hornby is right now sweating on this year because it's been 10 long years again since they last won the title. Okay, and the two of you are sweating over the same title. The same title. Oh, dear. Which, uh, as Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho would say, we're just a little horse. We're not supposed to win it this year, uh, so we'll let the others have it, you know. That's what he says. That's... Those are mind games. Those are Jose Mourinho <laughs> mind games, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> just the kind of thing we like. <laughs> and, and now, now this is this I love. Let's get out of here. Let's leave. We never should have turned the TV on today. Come on, we're leaving. And then he hovers by the door. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you really do feel that, that you just can't, can't stand to watch. You can't watch it anymore. Not when it's a really, really important game. Well, I, as I have told you on several occasions when we have been watching games um, together, 
I actually sometimes put my hands over my ears and lower my gaze because it's too tense. You really, it's hard to stand. I would not have believed how emotional it's possible to get watching a soccer game. In a way that, like, for example, baseball, which has a slower pace, and then it's fast, and then it's slow, slow, slow. It's not like that at all. Football is nonstop and can turn on a, forget a dime, it can turn on a happening. Well, the fact that it doesn't, unlike uh, American sports, have timeouts. Um, the, the clock runs for the first half. The first half and the second half each run for 45 minutes. And what is added on at the end of each half is what's stoppage. known as stoppage time. If a player has been injured for a minute, a minute's added on, they will add on time for substitutions. Um, Ooh, there's the first. There's the first. There's goal. the first that he's initially excited about. And then and also I love that this is sort of you see everybody, all the people in Paul's life, the people he's colonized, including the roommate. And I I, I just find that very, very touching. So who's that? These are those just like the refs? The the, the people in black is the man in black is the referee. Um uh, in red is Liverpool and Arsenal are playing in their away strip of yellow again, mm -hmm. which is what Mark Strong is. He's 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 wearing the right the shirt. away kit. The away kit, exactly. <laughs> and it it has to be put into perspective just how great Liverpool were at this period. I mean, throughout they had dominated from effectively from the mid 1970s right through the 1980s they won the title again the following year they won they had won it in 88 liverpool and they and they they lost it by just this one defeat in 89 and really it has to be said oh who's this well that's thomas the guy who Michael actually thomas. who scores the the winning goal but liverpool it has to be said at this time were reeling from the hillsborough disaster yes. which had only occurred a month and a half earlier. Yes. So they lost this year. This year they lost the title by this one defeat. They would win it again the following year in 1990, Liverpool would, but Liverpool have not won it since, which is, a, a, that is a remarkable statistic given how dominant that team, that's, that, that club has been. For them to go 24 years, well, let's, you know, they might win They're it They're haunted year, but, by uh, it still. It may I be. understand Stephen Gerrard had a relative who was killed. Yeah, I had heard that, yes. I, I'm not sure, but I had heard that. Here's where she's being compared to Dua Scott, George Graham. <laughs> Which she's heard before, <laughs> by the way, from Paul. Well, she seems Scottish to me, too. I mean, the, I think I think the actress I don't, Gemmell, I don't... is a, a sort of a Scottish name, and she may or may not be Scottish. But yeah. it seems to me that um, she's not a million miles from Scotland. She has that sort of clinical personality that we sort of associate sometimes with uh, people north of the border. Really, <laughs> <laughs> Canadians? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong border. Oops. So she runs away, again, see, only you would notice this. She runs away with nothing. Nothing. No purse. Look, look at that. How do you pay for a taxi? Did she, you know, is she wearing a money belt? Has she got her, her money in her bra? <laughs> I don't think so. She also doesn't look very pregnant. No, and we assume that it's quite a few months now, right? Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. She looks good in that dress, though, I have to say. It's a good look for her. It's it's a swell dress. It's a swell dress. Very pretty. From Topshop, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 the first time we've really seen her in color. You know, in in a color. It, it's obvious why it's red and white. Um I'll tell you, I like this taxi driver, too, and I'm not sure who the actor is, but he's very good. He says that he, he hasn't been to football in years, but he used to go to Arsenal, and then he goes, I'd love him to win tonight. I'd yes. bloody love it. And the way he says it is with a lot of conviction, and you do get this feeling 
again, of this community of fans. And part of it was neighborhood feeling, wasn't it? I mean, there's that lovely little bit when they're looking at the house right next to the stadium yeah. where he imagines people of another era kind of marching through the streets. And he loves that, Paul. Yes. Um, yes. Well, he he tells a story, doesn't he, at yes. one point about how in the old days they would lead they would take the them women would take the, the men to the sort of the, to the stadium station gates yeah. or whatever. Um, yes, he does, and there's like a little kind of brief imagining of it. So you you do get this feeling of tradition and time and and you know the generations of this community. It feels like something with a real tradition, which I like. I like very much. And and then you get that same thing again with that taxi driver who's so passionate. And he doesn't want to take her initially because he's taping the game <laughs> and doesn't want to know the score and realizes and today that, he'd be T Boeing. Yeah. Realizes that um you know, that uh, if he saw anybody in a bad mood he'd know they'd lost, or if they were in a good mood he'd know they won. Um But she she one, of the, him, yeah. one of those um, newspaper clippings that I think was in his classroom uh, made me laugh when I watched it the other day. It's The title was High Buried, the headline. Oh. High Buried, you know, indicating... Yes, they they're done. <laughs> 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 it's over. <laughs> I have to say that on my own many trips to Arsenal, particularly in this period in the 70s and 80s, there was not much joy for Chelsea. We always seemed to be on the wrong end of a thumping up there. Um, so uh, Highbury was not a particularly happy, happy place for us to go, and it was miserable having to go back to Arsenal Station after the game, knowing that you'd just lost 3-0 or something like Unless that. Unless your life would be in danger, from what you've said. <laughs> I like I like also the use of you know this real footage here of the game, which which does indeed look tense. Okay, so now she's here. He doesn't know it's her, yeah. but whoever it is, get away. This is the worst 60 seconds of my life. Because now we're down to very close to, you know, the end. Well, we're into almost into almost stoppage. Almost stoppage, time. yeah. I think the second goal comes actually in stoppage time. I think it's right before, because then there's a discussion how much stoppage is is there, and then they just kind of run roughshod over the stoppage. So now he's he's completely panicking. We're about to see probably the longest held scream in the yes. history of cinema. I know. A little bit of Which, it, okay, here we go. Here we go. And this involves, again, Michael Thomas. Who, they don't who, actually have the game clock up, so we don't quite know exactly what the minute and second was when he scored, but they delay this, too. They do. They sl put, go into slow-mo. Paul, oh, here he goes. <laughs> He's still screaming. And there it is. Actually, <laughs> uh, I mean, that was a miracle in a way. And everybody said, you know, oh, Michael Thomas, he's garbage. I mean, somebody says that in the mm. film. He's garbage until he scores the winning goal. Yeah, there. See, and... I, I, th I always feel bad for the mom because she's so excited and all by herself. She's been through a series of pretty horrible hairstyles in this. Uh... Well, that was the period. <laughs> <laughs> so here she is. She's wandering about. And I now here's, the, here's where they say this, two minutes of stoppage. And what does Colin Firth say? Watch, they're going to come right back and score. I think I'm right in saying that the people that come spilling out of the houses are the actual residents of these houses. Oh, really? I think that's oh, I right. Oh, I hope so. I'd love that. Well, because if you think about it, it's like how would they have been able to seal off the whole street and then use everyone's house to have actors falling out of? It makes sense that it would be... The people who, the people who actually, actually live, live there. there. And... I, I love the idea that everybody who lives around the stadium is an Arsenal fan and that this is a victory not just for the team but for this London community. It would be pretty hard to imagine living there and supporting, say, West Ham. It would be rough. You know, so... <laughs> You'd have to keep it on the down low. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you would choose to live literally 20 yards from a stadium unless you had some interest in it. 
Probably not. You and I visited uh, in Chicago, Wrigleyville, didn't we? Wrigley Field. Wrigley Field. Not that long ago. Yes. And we saw an amazing thing, which was nearby houses or apartments or terraces that had viewing platforms. Built on the built roofs. Built on the roof. of the, I had never seen anything like that before. No, and, and it shocked me to see it. So evidently the people who own the houses charge people to come up and sit on their roofs because there's a view of uh, Wrigley Field. Yeah, and, yet the, and, the, and, the, and the stadium, I mean, the club must get a piece of the action. Surely. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Do you but, think that, does this happen? I mean, have you ever been in Chelsea or near the bridge when they've won a championship? Well, unfortunately, during the period when I was a habitual regular, week in, week out regular, they didn't win very much. Um, but I do remember 1970, I went to the FA Cup final when Chelsea had beaten Leeds. They drew first at Wembley and then won a replay up at Old Trafford, Manchester United's ground. And then they had an open top, like a bus parade through the streets of Fulham. And I remember going to that. I think that's the only time that I've ever seen anything like this. And I'm assuming that this was the way it was. There's nothing actually a bit more hokey and and more unconvincing than when you see people celebrating something. Something that, that, that actually hasn't happened at that moment. <laughs> yes, or it happened many years earlier. It's, it has a very forced, uh, unconvincing, contrived look. To I it. agree, but, it's but, tough. But fine, that's that's the way it is. There's nothing can be done about that. Um, I, I, I want to believe that these people that are celebrating are the actual residents of the area because then at least... They could recreate th their there joy. Is, there's a certain verisimilitude <laughs> yes. about that if they were actors is, or extras. What is she wearing there? That's gorgeous. Looks like she's wearing um, scarf. A, a scarf with the gun on it. You know, that's the gun. Arsenal are known as the gunners and that's the big cannon. Well, that's, that's the a same, rather the, beautiful scarf. The same image that was on his boxer shorts, the little cannon. Yes, yes. Okay, and so the, here's the taxi driver, and now he's so happy to be there because he wouldn't have missed this magic yes. moment. Yes. And, of course, Arsenal's real rivals are not Chelsea. Or, um, it's Tottenham Hotspur, which is very close to them. They are the two North London teams, and so whenever Arsenal play Tottenham Hotspur, our friends in England, Dave Norris and his partner, Julie Spurs. Edwards, he supports Spurs. She's oh, Arsenal. That's right. It's oh. like, what do they do when they play each other? He said that they sit at opposite ends of the couch. <laughs> They're not like these two. <laughs> at least they both have the passion. Yeah, I know. Yeah, this, yeah I know. We're, we're, we're hardly buying it, but I'll tell you. Let's just look at Colin Firth. You can look at her if you want. Colin Firth, let's, you know, uh, we can summarize him. This guy is a movie star, actually. He, perhaps he always was, and now he certainly is. I'll tell you what he's always been is a fantastic actor. Just a fantastic actor and not like everybody else. You know, he was allegedly part of the Brit pack, but he has survived. It's been 30 years. You know, he won an Oscar quite recently for... Um, the King's Speech, and he was nominated the previous year for A Single Man. But he has been a wonderful actor all along and a terrific serious actor and also just a comic charmer when he wants to be. There, there is a warmth in him that I think is really special and rather unique amongst English actors who tend to be a little on the cool side. Not mm. that there's anything wrong with that. He's really sui generis. I love him. I think that's what makes him palatable to to um, American audiences is there is a sort of a conviviality about him that you can really see. There is a real easy, an easygoing charm there. Yes, and he, he also just thought, you know, we should mention it. He's one of the most socially committed mm. um, actors that I can think of in a very quiet way. He doesn't, you know, broadcast himself doing all of these things. No. But he has a background in this in that he had grandparents who were missionaries yes. in India. Yes. Um, well, we were, we were recently at an event, weren't we, where he was given an award for his humanitarian, humanitarian. activities. And, and boy, uh, was that a charming speech that he gave? Yes, yes. 
Um, and I do, I do have to say that I really like this closing shot. It makes Arsenal Tube Station look like one of the most inviting places Glamorous. on earth. Um, and that street, you almost kind of want to live there. There's a kind of a yellow brick road aspect to that yes. that, uh, that I really love. Um, Sadly, you could get an apartment in the stadium now. Now you could get an apartment in the actual stadium. Yeah. Um, Sorry to say. It's a beautifully, in a way, this is a beautifully crafted film. There is, as as odd as it might seem at times, um, there is a real... I, I don't find it odd. I've loved this movie since it first came out. I don't know how I managed to see it, but I was seeing like every English movie I could get my hands on. Um, I love it, but it's it's got a darkness. Maybe that's why I love it. Yes, and it's about a media that at that time you didn't know that you were going to have any interest in. No, I did not, but um, it was fascinating. And here we sit on February 6th, I think it is today, and just last Monday, February 3rd, Chelsea went to Manchester City in a title drawdown, uh, you know, in the sort of the three teams that could win the title this year, Arsenal, Man City and Chelsea. Chelsea did the unthinkable, almost as unthinkable as what just happened here with Arsenal going to Liverpool and winning. Chelsea went to Manchester City 1-1-0 and you called me right after the game and said, are you happy? And I said, I would be, but we have to go and play them again 12 days from now. Just like Paul. And Just so like Nick Hornby. And that is the ongoing, never-ending plight of the football fan. You cannot be happy in the moment, ever. You can only look forward to those horrible <laughs> events yet to come. And you love it that way. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way, if that's what you mean. There you go. So I think then, on that note, you have made a wonderful case for Fever Pitch, which we both like, and... Uh, I think I'd like to credit Nick Hornby, who is a pretty damn good author. Oh, he's his a wonderful books writer. books are good. And if this was his first screenplay, it may not be the first screenplay he ever wrote, but certainly I think it was the first screenplay that was ever produced. That right, he and he has since been Oscar-nominated for An Education. Yes, which is also a very, very good script. Yep. Another adaptation of a memoir, not his. Yes. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. And uh, I must say, there are many... Points of comparison with you, sir. Well, certainly Nick Hornby came out of his... You know, he went to Cambridge. Uh, he was one of those kids who uh, was able to go to Cambridge through a sort of a state program, which was great and, and was available to, to certain people. He's an educated guy. He's a smart guy. He is very, very talented, um, both as an author and as a, uh, a screenwriter. Um, it's a shame that he supports Arsenal. Um, he had the chance, I understand, to support Chelsea. His father took him to Chelsea, but he'd already been hooked by Arsenal. And you know, once those and magnets once snap together, once the magnets what are you snap together, do? you're lost. You're lost forever. Anyway, Julie Kergo, essayist and writer extraordinaire, yourself. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today on our audio commentary. Thank you, Nick. <laughs>